Hi everyone, um, I'd like to thank you for joining our webinar today, um, which will be providing an introduction to business and organisational psychology. I'm very happy to be joined by Dr. Chako Agnew, um, the Programme Director for our new online Masters in Business, Psycho business and Organisational Psychology um, and Associate Professor of Psychology at Harriet Watt University, Dubai, and also Greg Santham, Assistant Professor at Harriet Watt University, Dubai. Um, and so I'd just now like to hand over um, to Dr. Chako Agnew. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here today. Um, I'm very excited uh, to be here and tell you more about our online uh, master's and uh, in business and organizational psychology. Um, I'm an associate professor in psychology and the director of this program. Although Greg and Lucy um, is here today, I want to let you know that there's actually an army of uh, team behind behind this program. Um, Greg will shortly tell you uh, more about the course and actually will show you some examples uh, from the course. Uh, but before that, I want you to know that this program is uh, designed uh, with a specific focus on our audience, online students. It's not just a matter of uh, taking an on-campus program and putting it online, but it's really designed for online students around the world. Uh, first of all, it's very flexible. It's uh, I'm proud to say that it's very engaging, um, where I believe that most of uh, the students will want to go back often to look at what was there. And um, it also designed in a way that it offers you a platform to build your own community around the world with uh, like-minded people. Um, it's, it's very highly interactive too, in a way that we design activities, tasks, where you'll be applying constantly all the concept theories you learn to up to uh, up-to-date industry case studies. And uh, students will have this online discussion forms, uh, forums with um, other uh, students around the world, um, <clears throat> which again will add to the community you're building during during this program. Um, another exciting part of this program is that we designed, recorded videos all around the world. So while you're diving into the world of uh, psychology of workplace, you'll actually travel the world uh, around the developers, lecturers, uh, while you're applying all these concepts to this uh, case studies. Um, I uh, believe uh, Greg's short talk today will give you with examples a lot, lot better idea about uh, the program, how it was designed and what uh, you should be expecting to do. Um, I'm very excited to see that talk too. Uh, but please let us know if you have any questions um, after his talk. So me, Greg and Lucy will be more than happy to answer the questions. Thank you. Greg, stage is yours. OK, just to just to check everyone can see the slide. Is that correct? You can see that there? Yeah, okay. I can see. Good. So moving on, then um, let's get started. Then uh, according to the Association of Business Psychology, what is business and organizational psychology? Well, business psychology, I'm going to read it because it's the definition. Uh, business psychology is the study and practice of improving working life. It combines an understanding of the science of human behavior with experience of the world of work to attain effective and sustainable performance for both individuals and organizations. Of course, what we call working life has um, changed somewhat um, over the years and it's hard sometimes to work out where working life ends and the rest of life uh, begins. Um, so we often, when we're looking at this, we'll be looking at how working, working life and the rest of life sort of blend in with each other, particularly the case when you're studying something like this online and part time. Also, the science bit, um, the science of human behavior, that's pretty important because as I'll be talking about a little bit later on. One of the, the, the real um, justification, I suppose, for doing business psychology as opposed to just business studies is that it looks under the hood of those glossy theories and ideas that you may have come across in management courses and elsewhere. Look at, have a look underneath the hood and find out the bonnet and find out what works and what doesn't work, what's been going on, what's going on. 
So um, that's where we are. And also, the uh, just to, to clarify some confusion that sometimes occur, that um, in the United States, for example, it's called IO, or Industrial and Organizational Psychology. In the UK, it's called Occupational Psychology. And in the area we must now call mainland Europe, it tends to be called Work Psychology. So um, that's, that's um, the question now is why is it needed? How does it fit into the modern workplace? Well, it looks like this person has had a pretty rough day at work. But in fact, what's happened is um, this body was found uh, on the border of Austria and uh, Italy a, a few years ago. And it turned out it had been mummified by various climatic and geo, um, geological uh, changes, so that in fact it's 5,000 years old. Uh, something that's called Erzsi after the place it was found. Um, and so it was, it, it dates from about 3000 BC. It probably looked, he probably looked something like this in his day, based on the artifacts that were found near the body. Now, what's interesting um, from our point of view is that the amount of change that happened, if you take a timeline from then until pretty much near to now, um, is very slight. The, those tools that they found, the archaeologists found near the body and in the area, um, were tools which we can understand and which were part, an extension of that person's life. They were something which was almost like an extension of their body, extension of themselves. We understand what those things are now, even though it's 5,000 years ago, a bow and arrow, a bucket, a knife, all of those things were, and even when he was around 3,000, 5,000 years ago, these were just extensions of, of, of his body and his thinking. We learn to live with those things. They're part of our lives. Now, now what's happened is the pace of change has been so dramatic, so enormous, that we're kind of losing touch um, with the instinctive relationship we might have with our tools and the organisations that go with them. And in many ways, here's our, our modern person, um, who, who, who in many ways isn't so much clothed as, as more a kind of nexus of all kinds of networks and, and connections um, around around this person. The techno systems, that's meant to be a, an Apple watch, by the way, or smart watch. Um, a techno systems in, in which we operate, in which we, in which we try to work. The cultures that we live in have cha are changing all the time, and the subcultures and all kinds of other cultures around um, that we sometimes have to, to find out about, generational cultures, uh, which can come as a bit of a surprise in the workplace as much as anything else. And the types of leadership that tend to go with that are going to have to change, and have changed a lot, um, have to vary to, to suit the situations. And because of the diversity that we have, it's not just the diversity um, of cultures across the cross-national organisations and companies that we talk about, but also the increasing diversity of the uh, people working even within a country or within an organisation domestically, um, recognising their diversity. And um, as more people, as more different types of people are encompassed in the organisations, then the issue of diversity becomes that much greater. Back in the day, that, that guy who was, who, who was found dead from 5,000 years ago, you just have your village and you, understand, you knew everyone there and you knew how the tools worked. Nowadays, the organisation, the society, far more complex and we need help to associate, to get used to those things. So, the uh, spoiler alert here, um, a lot of the time, given this situation, we often don't know what's going on around us. We're in an organisation, stuff's happening, which we don't really see, we don't know how to notice it. And one of the things that this course is meant to help you do is to acknowledge and recognise and notice stuff that's going on around us. Spoiler alert here is that um, this is something we're trying to get across at the beginning of the organisational culture course, the idea that we don't know uh, a lot of the time what's actually happening and we need some help to be able to identify what's going on. This is me and it's also uh, Shackle, um, who are uh, and some fish. Organisational culture is hard to pin down. That's why there are hundreds of definitions in the literature and why it's so interesting. But how do we get to the heart of it at the start without, on the one hand, drowning it in definitions, or on the other hand, simplifying it down to nothing? Maybe think of culture as something we float around in, like the water for these fish. 
it sustains us but we don't notice it unless we're taken out of it or it goes bad or an outsider drops in and smells the damp. Some say culture emanates from hidden depths, maybe a kind of collective unconscious, but this is still an open question. But for sure, organizational culture is about shared unspoken assumptions, the routines and reputations that allow us to navigate on autopilot the currents of our organizational lives. A healthy organizational culture help us to cope and maybe even flourish. And when it goes bad, it's really bad and it feels like betrayal. An organizational culture can go uh, toxic or uh, become dysfunctional without anybody really noticing until it's too late. What's going on around here? Well, how did we get into this state? And then realigning or rebooting or resetting something you barely noticed was there in the first place can be very challenging which is why it's very useful to get to know about and to understand the aquarium of organizational culture. So I wonder if any of that seems familiar, any of those situations that are described there may seem familiar to you. So, what, you may ask, you may ask, what can I do with a qualification in business and organisational psychology? We're going to come back a bit later on and look at a little bit more detail on what the course involves, but let's see why, why we should start doing it in the first place. So, um, yeah, so what, do you, what kind of skills do you get? Um, and so there's a wide range of skills which are, are valuable to employers. And it's important to point out that, again, this, this idea of the, of the advantage you have from doing psychological research-based approach, psychological theories and research methods being used in the workplace, that what you're doing is you're looking under the hood of the glossy appearance of the theory and things that you might use in a business course. You're looking inside and finding out what works and why doesn't it work. Um, and that's one of the main features of a psychology master's as opposed to any other kind. It's a critical approach. Um, to, to, to the material that we're looking at. So that leads us to the possibility of, of designing and conducting and analysing research, uh, research studies. And by, by that, when we say doing research studies, implementing interventions, it doesn't mean you are doing something that's going to get a Nobel Prize. You're not, you're not meant to be doing something which is going to be um, put, put into a, a journal, necessarily a journal article in an academic uh, world, but it could just be finding out what's going on, ways to find out what's happening around us. Has what we said we've done, has it worked? Are women actually getting uh, um, offered the jobs? Uh, let's go and ask. Let's find out what's going on. That's the kind of thing which we're talking about when we're talking about genuinely applying practical research in your workplace. It doesn't have to be high-flown high, high flown stuff, although you will be doing some of that as well. So using data analysis and relevant software tools is something that you'll be uh, quite comfortable with by the time you finish the course. And knowing about leadership and team structures um, is pretty important because that's what that's the, we, we live with those most of the time. And particularly worth looking at, we're we'll looking at later on and in the course, is the, the misunderstandings we have about leadership. There are myths and romances about leadership which need to be uh, to be torn down, and uh, uh, there needs to be a wider understanding of leadership we should be looking at. And so uh, areas like selection, training, performance and management, talent management, these are all uh, bread and butter stuff, really, within when we're applying psychology within uh, in, in, in human relations. Um, OK, so what can we get um, and what, how relevant are they to the wider world? There's, there's loads of areas where the skills you get in, 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 um, in the business psychology can, can be applied, transferred, all kinds of different areas, training, because you learn how, how people can understand things, um, um, all to do with, with retention, um, how, how can people how can people have things explained, uh, how can you find out whether your training has worked, uh, management and leadership, uh, we talked about leadership management, these are very much closely intertwined um, these days. Um, and advertising and marketing, there's a lot of um, psych social psychology, for example, comes from originally um, psych um, psychological research into how marketing works. So that's a very close relationship. Coaching is something which has become a massive area of growth all over the place. 
where you can help people um, and develop themselves without having to intervene, without having to tell them what to do. And that, that's the skill which uh, we'll be looking at when you're doing the coaching course, for example. Data analytics, we talked about the importance of that. The area of economics and human factors, how do you how do people manage to interact with the systems, for example, the technology with, when you, with which you have to operate? And this has a lot to do with the safety of organizations, um, not just you know small you know, whether you fall over or what, it can do with whether whether you have disasters. And these are all connected. Um, and of course, in relation to human resources, that's a, again, as I say, a standard area within which the skills of business psychology are highly transferable. And in fact, over half of our graduating students go into relevant areas to work, for example, business psychology, HR, consultancies, coaching uh, and, and training. So something just, just a, a, almost a random sample of just things that people often, often ask about. Um, consultancy um, is something which is obviously you're going to you can be involved in in all kinds of different ways. People want to, are going to want to know how to do stuff, uh, and you know how to do it, so you can help, and hopefully you can you can notice stuff that people don't, other people don't notice, and you have your um, uh, material knowledge at your fingertips, and also very importantly, you have the knowledge um, the skills to find out probably what they need to find out. Coaching, we've mentioned analytics again, um, is areas that, that uh, is always in, in demand. And then um, diversity and training, the whole area of diversity. What do we mean by diversity? Um, how do we manage it? Um, all of those issues are something which are, are, are growing enormously and something which we address for, in, in a whole course within the uh, business, business psychology. So um, these, all, sorry, these are all the things that you could be doing. Um, and I'm not going to read through all those, but just to just take a, a quick scan through those and you can see um, a whole load of stuff which you may not have thought was necessarily business psychology, um, but it is. So again, you can we can come back to these with, with questions at a later stage, um, but uh, you had a bit of time while I'm mumbling on there to have a little rouse through those and get the idea. So how and why was the programme developed? And the story of that is really the story of of moving from being used to the idea of teaching and presenting this material on campus, but then appreciating what's involved in transferring it to online. And then this journey of discovering really how to make this transfer to the online environment has been has been fascinating and, and uh, one which has involved a lot of learning on all our parts. I think the main thing to be aware of is that online learning isn't a poor person's version of the on-campus learning. What we've discovered is there's loads of opportunities made available by the online environment that isn't, they're not really available necessarily on campus. So there's, there's things you can get out of this that you wouldn't necessarily get if you were a full-time student um, working uh, uh, on campus. I mean, let's, let's have a look at this. So on, on the left-hand side there, you can see that um, people would, uh, you, if, you, if you're on campus, you have that nice bit of space that's all your own. Um, my space and no one's going to get into it. You can go to the library and you can do your own thing. You have this, this, con this control area that belongs to you. And when you have lectures, uh, the timeline of your life is nicely segmented. You've got your own section of the day's time which is yours that's mine and it belongs to me so you're in that lecture and unless you've got your phone on or something it's not a good idea you are going to be focusing on what's there that's something which you can't necessarily do when you're working online when you're doing other things you're part-time got other things to do that space over there that normally would have been yours is having constant invasions of one sort or another, incursions from, uh, it could be fellow workers, it could be from need to change the, the nappies, not fellow workers, but of, of small children, um, and, and other kinds of incursions that are going on um, as you're working, working in the home or uh, as your time is being broken down. And so this space um, tends to be um, um, somewhat um, broken up, kind of somewhat fragmented. Similarly, your time could well be fragmented 
bits are being taken out of it, interruptions um, all over the place of one sort or another, to the extent that it doesn't really feel like it's your time anymore. It becomes a bit impoverished, and also you may have to do a bit of extra um, late at night or another time and try and catch up on that. So what we're doing with this course is trying to find ways of turning that into a kind of advantage. And one, in terms of the um, space, well, your space is the virtual environment. And there's all kinds of different ways uh, in which we're creating or attempting to create a, uh, an environment which is within itself uh, relatively enclosed and controlled. Your community is going to be across um, across borders, across all over the place, um, and you're going to be talking to people asynchronously as well. So you won't necessarily be having a face-to-face, um, -face, um, uh, so not synchronous conversation. But nevertheless, so that virtual environment is one which is adapted to your needs. Similarly, in terms of time, the, the thing that, uh, that we often uh, encounter is this, and I've been involved in this myself, I've been there doing some part-time courses online, um, they often, how do you, you do something for a while, then you have an interruption, something else happens, and then you get to start all over again to come back to it. So one of the things that we've tried to emphasize is creating momentum. So when we establish um, the, the, the idea at the beginning of a course, or of an idea, then it should be something which can be carried over. You can just pick it up again off the other one. So establish something which you, gains your interest, gets you involved. Um, hooks. Um, things which uh, you can come back to, uh, an idea presented concisely and simply so that you can ref reference back to it easily without having to start all over again. And the designs of career-aligned courses so that what you do, what your assignments do, are actually ones which relate to what you're doing in your work. And that the assignments you do and the assessments you do are ones which you can be you can use as a portfolio. You can use them again. They're not going to be things you just throw away when you finish this, finish, finish a course. So looking at this, for example, let's take the idea of momentum. Um, let's say you have this, this task. Apply psychological principles of innovative, innovative team collaboration to designing a stimul and simulating virtual work environment. Now, I'm not going to just say, right, here's some principles, go away and do it. What we try to do is to give you something to get your teeth into, give an example to work with. And so, for example, here we have um, we've built one here. We've got um, the my thought here was let's have um, each worker has got their own bubble, and with all the resources they need. And uh, these bubbles are tra traveling forward across a a ever changing but always beautiful landscape. And that when people need to talk to each other and, and team up, then these bubbles will coalesce. Now, these are just some thoughts uh, thrown out, but this hopefully would get you thinking about what kind of stuff you could do, what kind of design you might have here for applying the principles that we've established. So once you've got something in your head, it's difficult to throw it out. Um, once you've got the idea or narrative going, then you should then be able to work with it and come back to it as you need to. That's what I mean by setting up some momentum. Also, a hook, setting up ideas, uh, making them clear and concise so that you don't have to relearn them every time you come back to them. Something you can refer to, it's a hook. And here's a brilliant one that uh, Lucy came up with, which was um, to present you know, quite a complex idea, but present it in such a way that you'll always remember what it is. Um, this isn't Lucy, but this is Lucy here. Um, but you'll hear her voice in this example. Stage one. Ending, losing, letting go. When faced with change, this stage is often marked with resistance and emotional upheaval. When skydiving, you are about to leap from a very high place. There can be feelings of fear, uncertainty and disorientation. Once you have jumped, there can be a sense of loss, loss of control, orientation and of course gravity. People have to accept that something is ending before they can begin to accept the new idea. Stage two, the neutral zone. In this stage, people affected by the change are often confused, uncertain and impatient. After jumping, you start to stabilise yourself, yet there are still feelings of anxiety and often scepticism about the change. Will you make it down to the ground okay? Although an uncomfortable time where you may still feel lost, there can also be feelings of creativity and renewal. Finally, stage three, the new beginning. 
your parachute has gone up and you start to feel more calm. This last stage is a time of clarity and acceptance. There can be feelings of high energy and openness. People have begun to embrace the change initiative. They're building the skills they need to work successfully in the new way of working. And there's one of several examples of how the how we can use media in order to establish an idea which is sort of nicely set in your mind so that you haven't, got, you haven't got to spend too much time acquiring it, you can set about applying it and questioning it. And so um, this is sort of uh, the, align, the career alignment of the courses are designed to make, help you do stuff that you need to use and apply elsewhere. So, for example, um, building your own models of culture they don't have to be um, smart ones like the, the, um, the um, printed one here, but also you, any hand drawn ones um, would be handy. And how you do that, we'll obviously be finding out during the course. But you don't have to depend on the, uh, all the models that are provided for you. Once you understand the models and what went into them, you can build them yourself for your own purposes, devising practical performance tests. Um, using uh, experimental methods, um, devise and deliver a leadership activity. And that's one of the assessments uh, in leadership. Um, the, the leadership in unexpected situations can be set up, will be set up for you. Um, even designing and evaluating an airship control system, um, setting up a working a virtual working environment, such as we just saw there, and also having to contribute to an incident response team simulation. These are all. Um, examples of, of the many, many courses, many, many activities similar to those that you'll um, be engaging in when you do the course. Um, and then that will give you a portfolio of achievements. Um, for example, you'll be constructing a, a diversity policy, building a safety culture, um, reporting to a CA on how to address cultural alignment, writing a report, um, practical evaluation of an interactive system, and delivering and evaluating leadership workshop, developing coaching skills. All of these are things which you would be assessments, you'll do material for this, but this then is something which you'll then use later on. You're not going to just throw it away when you finish the course. And to help you with these evidence-based solutions, don't be scared by the journalist, the journal articles that you're often pointed to. We're not going to say, right, go and read these articles. Sometimes, I don't know really how much academic work you might have done in the past, but um, uh, reading these articles, uh, journal, academic journals, is often like, I find, chewing cardboard, and they're often designed to be almost unreadable, I think. Uh, a lot of the time they're okay, but other times not. Anyway, the point is that what we do is provide you with guidance on how to get through them. So there's a typical page from a task um, for example, you'd be asked to skim read rather than to read in detail initially. And then look at, we, we lead you to specific sections and tell you what bits to look for and what to find, which tables to go for, what to leave out, um, how you can organise your notes on this. So we don't just say go and read this massive article and write some notes on it. You'll get very specific guidance on how to do it. And then you will get, uh, when you've completed this, you then get feedback um, comparing where uh, one of us would have put down um, some suggestions about what you can do there, and then you can compare them and give you, you get some thoughts on that. So you're not on your own. You're getting feedback and help um, all the way through. So to sum up, these are the things that you'll be looking at. Um, you're going to have there's workplace culture, um, there's leadership, talent management. We're looking at diversity, um, organisation change, research analytics, workplace coaching, workplace design. These are all the things, the sort of main course areas that we'll be focusing on. And what you've seen today, some of the examples you've seen today, come from most of those, bits of them from each of those are brought, in, brought into play. Okay, that finishes what, pretty much what I have to say. Um, and now we hand over any questions. I think I'm handing over to Rebecca here to, to deal with that. Yeah, thank you so much, Greg. I think that was a, a great, um introduction to, to the field of business and organizational psychology um, and to the whole concept and, and ethos of the program as well. Um, so we do have time for questions at the moment. I think everyone should have access to the meeting chat. If you have got any questions for us, feel free to just pop them in there. We've got a couple of people on hand to um, help answer those um, within the chat um, and also our speakers ourselves. Um, we do have a few questions that have been sent in, in advance. Um, so I'd like to kick off with those, if that's okay. Um, so I'll just um, address the first one to you, Greg. 
Um, so we had a question which was asking, what are the th top three traits of a good leader, in your opinion? OK, well, as usual with psychology, the answer is it depends. Um, it's never, never black and white or very rarely black and white. Um, you also, that particular question um, is actually the first thing we cover in the leadership course, um, because it's an issue that, we, that needs to be addressed straight on at the start. I think um, one of the th th points is that there aren't any three traits because it depends on what kind of leader you want, what kind of, what kind of leader you're looking for. Um, but there's been uh, arguments about what the traits should be for a leader for generations now. Um, and they, in fact, the psycholo psychologists have produced lists of these traits, which vary uh, often depending on the fashions of the generation that they happen to be produced in, but also which will depend on um, the particular kind of leader that you want. And also the, the question of what's a good leader is, is one of the big issues. Do we mean an effective one, a successful one, or maybe a tenacious one? Uh, just happens to be there for a long time. It doesn't necessarily mean to say they're good, successful, or anything else. So this question of what we call a good leader, what, what is leadership about? And are we just concerned with trying to make good leaders, or are we concerned with just taking leaders as they come, whatever they are, and, and working with that? Those are all issues which we'll be addressing during that particular course. So yeah, the usual answer, um, it depends. Um, we had another question um, which was asking, um, how do you see the advancements of artificial intelligence or AI affecting the workplace? Well, that's one which turns up um, in the later stages of the, uh, of the of course we do on human factors workplace design um, in quite some detail. Um, but, so the, the jury is still out, actually. Obviously, it's not something which people have got solutions for. Um, Certainly, when it comes to well, one of the, I think one of the one of the points is that you know sixty percent of the jobs that we have now didn't exist a generation ago, and we can safely assume that AI is going to have that effect on the kind of profiles that we imagine for jobs. And um, we probably can't imagine what the jobs are going to be in twenty years' time, uh, and AI is going to have a major effect on that, and already has. We're already living with AI. To some extent, um, there's AI operating, you know, on our word processors, um, and all of those things are are um, are part of AI. The other thing, a lot of the routine stuff that we've had to deal with, um, all of that is uh, something which AI is is, do, is going to do for us, and that's going to cause changes. Do we have to worry about um, AI taking over? Um, maybe, but I think we have more to worry about the owners of the AI taking over than the AI itself. Um, an area of particular interest in, human, in, in this area of human factors, um, workplace design, is explainable AI. How do you uh, teach the AI, and this is where psychology is really important, how do you teach the AI to explain what it's doing to human beings so that we can maintain, that, make sure that we're all in the loop? Thank you. Uh, another question um, we received in advance was, um, do you think the pandemic, or how do you think the pandemic has affected the workplace, in particular, the relationship between employers and employ employees? Yeah. It's opened up a lot of options, a lot of possibilities. I think people didn't fully appreciate what was possible um, with working from home, for example, and, and then ending workplace. Um, and that's something which has, has exploded um, because of the pandemic. And what sometimes what's happened is is employers um, are kind of uh, um, uh, awestruck by the the fact, the fact that they've coped during the pandemic and people are able to work from home and, and have virtual environments and so on. And they then want to introduce it full time. But the difference between coping and certain producing something that's sustainable um, and that kind of con conflict where um, employers maybe wanting people to do stuff which they they scramble to do during the the, during the um, um, during the, the, the pandemic um, trying to convert that into something which is sustainable uh, isn't quite as straightforward as as they might have hoped. The it's also quite highly politicised. I think you find um, I remember looking at the Daily Mail recently, the British right wing newspaper, um, talking about well, not working from home but shirking from home, um, and yet the fact is. Uh, that the evidence suggests that people tend to be more productive if they're working from home, more satisfied in general. Um, and so maybe uh, um, there's, there's a lot of options which are, are available. Um, it's truly still out, and there's still a lot of arguments. There's a mixture of evidence about how effective uh, working from home um, and the related um, uh, technological developments is, and um, the political arguments um, about um, a social control, for example, 
Um, that's all still very much being played out at the moment, and something which we address um, quite explicitly in a, in a couple of the main courses that we do. Great. Um, I can see, I think, Chakal is maybe wanting to, to jump in at this point. Yeah, thank you very much, Greg. Yeah, amazing. And I think the presentation really ref reflects uh, the pedagogy and the effort behind and the enthusiasm and passion behind this program. Um, I just want to uh, say two things. One is the one of the questions, uh, not the admin question, sorry, I'm not the right person for that. And one question is about where do you see the main difference between business and organizational psychology? And um, so this question often comes uh, in UG degrees too. So there are different names. In US, it's called industrial and organizational psychology. In UK, occupational psychology, which is a, a master's degree, which you expected to have a, a, either a conversion psychology degree or a, for your UG degree, very much protected by the BPS, British Psychological Association, whereas, and then we have many business psychology programs. However, we wanted to call this program business and organizational psychology, because normally when you <clears throat> when you say, let's take industrial and organizational psychology, the first part really implies the uh, job requirements and um, uh, the people we hire, assess, uh, train based on this uh, job demands and requirements. So, it, it covers that. Um, however, when we say organizational psychology, it's more about the interaction, relationships between uh, employees. Uh, then we talk about motivation, satisfaction, leadership, culture. So uh, this program is called Business and Organizational Psychology because we, we want to make sure that the name reflects uh, the, what we cover uh, during the course. And just want to add one more thing very quickly. Um, on top of uh, all Greg's explanations based on this pre questions, um, we also see now in the in the past uh, we see literature really talking about when we effective leadership or culture, whatever you're talking about in the workplace was always linked to uh, more successful businesses, more uh, increased performance. But now we're really talking about happy workplaces. Um, how it relates to success. So when we developed this program, uh, we always uh, kept this in mind as an SO. So it's not only about um, effective businesses, but we really need to talk about uh, happy workplaces too. And um, so I think that an another question here about uh, coaching, but I think Lucy already answered that. And the rest of the questions I see about uh, payments and uh, certificates. So. Um, yeah, I'm not great with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think Hassan has, has jumped in to answer a few of the, the more okay. admin um, related questions. And um, we've got a couple more questions that um, were also sent in prior. Um, just, so just, one just... More thing. just one more thing there, I think you mentioned what, what um, Chackle was saying. Uh, we do want to make the business psychology course, business, business organisation psychology course, a happy working place too. Um, because we, we actually found that as we were developing the tasks and the activities, that we wanted to come up with things that we would enjoy doing, that would be fun for us to do. Um, and that's one of the tests as to whether something would actually get included as an activity in the course. Absolutely. Do we have... Um. Even even if for people uh, who couldn't attend here, or I'll just say it because it's recorded. Um, so if they have any questions later, um, they can find me on LinkedIn. I put it there, Chuckle Agnew, or they can email me. Again, I put my email address there. Please feel free to uh, email email me. Accept the uh, payments. Um, our student success advisors um, will also be in hand after this webinar um, to answer any questions relating to the program as well. Um, at the end of the presentation, I'll provide um, email addresses and links um, for people to be able to, to follow up with us. Um, I'm just going to hop back to, to one other uh, question that we had. Um, so someone is saying, I'm currently working as a manager. Do you have any suggestions as to how I can get the most from my team, both in terms of productivity and morale. I think that's um, a very Rebecca, I'm sorry. 
Sorry, but I just realized there's a, there are questions in the Q&A section here related to very specifically to the program. So one of them is, uh, why should I choose to study this course at Hale Watt uh, rather than a course at any, any other institute? Um, I would say definitely the uh, how we develop this course uh, as Greg the examples Greg, Greg gave here I think really reflected how we designed it it wasn't really an exercise of just uh, taking a campus one applying to an on online platform so you're not going to see people recorded themselves uh, lecturing about the topic or you're not going to see chunk of text to read so it's really uh, designed for working people uh, to keep them engaged, that we really want the students uh, really wanting to go back to what's out there, uh, wanting to watch those videos and really wanting to uh, do these activities. And again, as Greg said, it just really the team behind it uh, really reflects the energy uh, this program has. Um, and also, I think uh, Harriet Watts is a, is a uh, very established university and very experienced. And we are very experienced in business psychology too, because for many years, we have business psychology program on campus, not only in Dubai, we also have in Edinburgh and Malaysia campuses too. Um, so there's another question. I missed a few minutes, so may I uh, com time commitment? Uh, Yes, so this is designed uh, for people working full time who can't come uh, to the campus. So um, I would say we don't recommend uh, we don't recommend students uh, to buy to get more than uh, two courses uh, while they are working full time. Uh, time management wise, uh, I don't think it's realistic while working full time to do more uh, more than three courses. Um, the, but the online assessments um, can be done. Um, again, admin, admin uh, will be better to answer that, but the online assessments, will, you'll have the opportunity to take the online assessment three times a year, so there's a lot of flexibility there too. Uh, so there's another question here. Uh, whether it is accredited by BPS or ABP, so it would be we are hoping to get accreditation by, uh, by ABP, but it's very new, so not yet. Um, anything else? I'd like to do the MSc over two years. What units should I get it for? Okay, so when you register, we recommend to students start with uh, two courses, which is organizational culture and leadership. And uh, after this, because these are the main core courses that will help you progress in the other courses, give you a better idea. Um, and then uh, you can choose uh, depending on that. I was running through the question. I don't know. Let's see if there's more on the chat box. I think they're answered. OK. Sorry, Greg, I caught you there okay. about morale. <laughs> no um, yeah, all the morale thing. Um, yeah, so yeah, 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 so we might not come another. Yeah, so uh, just in response to that question, it's a very general question. It obviously depends on particular circumstances, but the from the evidence of of the the, the, the most general uh, principles would be listen, listen, listen. Um, just make sure you're listening to what people are saying, so you know what's going on. I think what we said uh, one of the things is running through um, this whole presentation is that a lot of the time we're trying to find out what's going on. Um, um, it, in many ways, it's often suggested nowadays that um, the best a leader can do is to try and provide people with a credible account of what they think is going on uh, in their organisation. Things change so fast and things are so fluid that um, that's the way things are. The idea of the of the leader on top of the mountain telling us all where to go in an organisation, scanning the horizon and giving us all instructions, that is a thing of the past. And so um, that's a, a key idea behind how you motivate people is to make sure that you you, you understand that they are the organization so listen 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 courtesy as a principle rather than uh, just a, a nice thing is crucial um listening sharing um and allowing equal time allowing time to people to say what they want to say um give people the confidence there's something from ed catmull for example one of the big people behind Pic pixel Pixar um, is confidence, give people confidence to share unfinished work. Um, 
something people tend not to do. People tend to hang on to what they're doing, uh, and only when they feel confident that they can show them everybody else um, and, and not get to made a fool of um, do they release it. But of course, all the development stuff um, that could be done, taking into account, taking taking advantage of the variety of people who can put input, um, uh, that tends to be lost. So I think that simple simple principle: um, having people with confidence to share unfinished work is really important. And bottom line is shared goals. If you've got a diverse organisation, particularly, um, it doesn't where people don't know what they're all meant to be doing, what they don't have a shared goal, then you've really got problems. So shared goals uh, as a finishing point there. Just one more. I don't want to leave any questions unanswered here because I, I think this is an imp good question here. Since this is online with videos pre-recorded, if we have any questions or need further clarification how can we reach out so although this is online and uh, pre-recorded it, it doesn't mean that you're left alone every online module will have a leader they're not going to come and teach anything but we have discussion boards so there will be constant uh, input from the course leader in those uh, discussion boards there will be assigned tutor if you need to reach out about any specific questions there uh, yeah I hope now we answered all the questions, I believe. Thanks. I can see this one here from Lindsay just asking about is registration open for the modules now? Um, currently, um, if you've not yet inquired or applied um, for the programme, um, there is a register your interest um, form on the website, um, which we'll provide a link to um, that you, you can fill out um, and receive updates um, about the program, including when enrollment for the program opens, um, which will be opening shortly. Um, just having a look at the time, I don't know, Greg, if um, we have time to take a couple of more questions. I don't really, if, if people are not dropping out, then um, yeah, otherwise. <laughs> let's, take one, let's take one more question because I want yeah. to, uh, yeah, yeah, don't run over time, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll just take one more that we, we got in, uh, in advance, um, and that was how can businesses um, measure the effectiveness of their employee training and development programs? Yeah, this is one of the areas that's, that's always a problem, the, the evaluation of training. Uh, nobody likes evaluation of training, that's one of the problems. Um, and and um, what it tends to be left to is what, you know, what we call the happy sheets. That after a training session, everybody fills out that, that form saying, you know, how, how, how satisfied are you with it? And you hand it in to the person who delivered the course. Um, and then, surprise, surprise, it tends to be OK. Um, finding out how things, how effective the training is in the longer term and how deep it goes is, is the real issue. And the, the deeper the training, the harder it is to, to trace its effectiveness probably over a longer period of time. And the, the bottom line there is that two things. One, you need to have organisational continuity and organisational memory. That if someone does, has done some training six months ago and everyone's forgotten about all that stuff and, and other things are happening, then no one's getting the position to, to, to follow it up. And secondly, to have a proper understanding of what people were meant to be trained in in the first place. So we know we can, we can use a bit of agile uh, responses in order to find out um, how how the what they've what they've done is emerging. So you may not necessarily have a rigorous systematic um, evaluation program set up right from the start as soon as the training is finished, but you may find that as you see what's going on, um, how things are emerging, that you may want to develop and, and um, formulate um, different ways of measuring. Um, what's, what's, what's coming out of the course, if it's been a particularly interesting and, and, and constructive one, uh, often the more interesting and constructive the course, the more interesting and constructive the evaluation has to be. There you go. Thanks. Thanks so much, Greg. And um, if you could go to the final slides, that would be Oh, yes. Oh, yep. So click you on there. Yeah. So, so just to close, um, I'd like to mention, um, as I uh, said before, um, that if you haven't already um, applied or inquired about the program, um, you can fill out the register your interest form, um, which you'll find on our website by following the URL on the screen. Um, if you've got 
any specific questions about the program, um, you're more than welcome to email us directly. Um, you can email our student success team um, via the email address shown on the screen, um, and one of our advisors will be in touch shortly. Um, also, if you'd like to catch up on this webinar, um, we'll be sending out the recording and the slides in due course, um, and we'll update you about this via email. Um, and so with that, I'd like to thank both Greg and Chackle again for providing a fantastic insight into business and organisational psychology um, and for everyone um, for joining us here today. Um, just want to wish you a great rest of your, rest of your day or evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, and thanks again for joining us. Thanks, thank, you. thank you. Bye, everyone.